Mary and I are going to bless you today. We love being able to speak together. We don't always have the opportunity. So today, I'm praying it's going to bless you because we're going to be talking about being able to overcome and conquer the challenges that life throws your way. It's going to go right in line with my 42 book that will be released coming up on Easter Sunday morning, How to Finish Well When You Thought You Were Finished. So let's talk about that. Romans chapter 8, listen to the conquering, the overcoming that you're going to hear, the spirit of it that you're going to hear in our reading today of Romans chapter 8, verse 35 down to verse 39. Let's read together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Come on, let's pray together. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we gather this morning and we open your word, that something will be stated and said in this environment that'll touch each of us right where we are at. Some are going through those experiences, Lord, right now under the sound of our voice where they feel like they are separated from you or even the life that they had thought they would be able to live, the life that you planned for them to live. And our words today will help inspire them, we ask, Lord so they can live the kind of life you are calling them to live, not just here in the church, but outside of these walls. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So 42, book that came out of an experience of my heart attack back on June the 17th in 2007. I was 46, didn't turn 47 yet. That came in November. But little did I know that I would experience something in my life, both physically, but also spiritually and emotionally as time went on, that was something sim similar to what Mary was reading today, that I felt or that could have separated me from what was God's ultimate plan for my life. I'm just going to take you into the story a little bit as we put it here in the book to that particular night when it actually occurred. Later in the evening, Mary and I ran to the store, shopping list in hand. Usually, I stick pretty close to her as, in times past, it has proven moderately dangerous to set her loose with a credit card. However, as we darted through aisle after aisle, I began to feel tired. Mary had her arms full of picture frames and asked over her shoulder, Steve, could you get me a shopping cart, please? Normally, I'd have already seen her struggling and grabbed one, but my body felt like it was filling up with concrete, so I pretended not to hear her. After a few more minutes of browsing, before she could ask me again, I said, Mary, you go ahead and finish up. I just need a minute's rest. She stopped and looked at me with surprise. You look ashen, Steve. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, I said. Just tired from dealing with the RV and everything else. I'll be in the furniture area. Let me know when you're ready to go. Then I drug myself over to a chair and sat down, exhaustion settling in. Sure, it was a busy season with everything going on at the church we pastored, closing on a new condo, and now our, our RV extravaganza. But I've always been a high-energy guy with plenty of capacity. This fatigue was strange, not at all my modus operandi, but we would soon find out the worst was yet to come. Life was full, but I thought everything was under control. However, it wasn't until Mary and I left the furniture store and headed back to the condo that I learned things weren't as solid as they seemed. And as we left, we got a call that the furniture movers would be there soon, waiting to deliver our furniture. So we raced back to beat them there, and on the way, the humidity gave way to a downpour. Fatigue or no fatigue, I had to sprint from the truck up the stairs 
to pull out patios, large sliding glass doors off their tracks so the movers could fit everything in. I tugged the first one out of place, grunting. Do you need help with that, Mary asked, concerned. I think I got it, I replied. But as I reached for the second door, an uneasy feeling crept into my upper chest and left shoulder. I stopped to rub the area, thinking I'd strained a muscle. Steve, is everything okay, Mary asked. I sat down, but the pain intensified and waves of nausea flooded my stomach. I said, listen, I'm going to go next door and use the bathroom. I think I just have some heartburn. The kids were engrossed in a game that didn't notice my entering my parents' condo, sweating and clutching my stomach. I barely made it to the master bathroom before getting sick. I stood trying to collect myself, but I winced as the chain moved from my pain moved from my left shoulder toward the center of my chest. It felt like an elephant had just sat on top of me. And there it was. I knew what was coming. I looked at myself in the mirror and said, No, Lord, not now. Job's words sprang to my mind. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. Real fear flooded my body. Not for me, but for Mary and the kids. Above every other role, I cherished the title of father. So I limped through the door in a half run, half stumbled back to our condo. A focus and calm washed over me, like a fighter about to enter the ring against an opponent of unknown size. I didn't know what was about to happen, but I did sense I was entering the fight of my life. There was no place for panic. However, the situation was deathly serious. With my children's laughter still ringing in my ears, I said as calmly as I could, Mary, call 911. So the fight began. And that's pretty much the beginning of the story of 42 that has finally been put in a book that took place over 15 years ago. And I pray that you will sense as you pick up this book, like a good Netflix movie, that sometimes life isn't always fair, but if you handle life right, you'll still end up finishing well in life. Amen. And I think we all have this question. I have it. What ha why has it taken 15 years to release this book? Why, Mary? Why, Has Steve? it taken us 15 years? There's a couple of reasons. Well, Mary and I over the years, you know, as a pastor, we've had grace for people that go through hard times. We have. But I can't say it was always a balanced grace. Because when a person would go something, we'd be, go through something, we'd be quick to say to them, hey, we're going to pray with you. But in our mind, we're thinking, now it's time to get up and get over it. Let's go. We got to keep moving forward. And though we knew what psychologists tell us when a person goes through a difficult time, there's like a, I don't know, a container of liquid that we have in the back of our brain that helps us cope with the challenges of life. We had even taught people that, that if they go through a divorce, then give yourself some time to rebound because your coping oil that is there in your brain to help you deal with the stresses and the challenges of life, it'll deplete some things. So for instance, if you got 100 gallons of that stuff, a divorce will rid you of all 100 gallons like that which leaves you with hardly anything then to cope for any other challenge that you have in life. If you go through the death of a loved one, 100 gallons, boom, gone. It's hard for you to cope with other challenges. We had taught all of that. We taught about bankruptcy and how it'll, it, it'll cause you to lose some of that coping oil. We taught, talked about how people going through a change of a career how that affects their ability to cope. We had talked about all those things and we thought we knew about it until we went through one of these experiences. And the reason it has taken 15 years to finally pin the words to this book is because every time we would go touch it, just emotionally, the floodgates would just open 
and I didn't have the ability to finish it. I always hit a wall. The truth is, I wrote this book over a hundred times, but could never finish it because I would hit that wall. And emotionally, all those thoughts, all those feelings came back. Not so much that I was hurt and in pain from what occurred, but the fear that I had that came soon after, the vulnerability that came up soon after this kind of experience, that one, I could have lost the privilege of being married if things didn't turn out the way they did. I, I wouldn't have had the joy of living and seeing my kids where they're at today, seeing little grandbabies in our lives, seeing this church do what it's done and seeing both campuses do what they've done. I, I would have missed out on all that. So that's where the emotion comes from today when I read it that I just can't believe that was my life because I never sowed towards that except maybe eating too many cheeseburgers when I was in college. But that was one of the reasons. It's just, it was too much of a toil. Plus this year, yes, it's the year of the Spirit. So the timing's right for us. Yeah, it is the right time. It's the perfect time. And we know a lot of people are going to be blessed by this story. But why the title 42? What is that particular number all about for you? Some, some of you may know the story. Most of you probably don't. But why 42? Why is that so important? When... You called 911, and immediately we heard the sirens. This was in Stewart, Florida, where we have our condo. And if it was Miami, I don't think I would have been alive. The response time would have been way too long. But the station, the paramedic station, was right behind our condo. And our condo is probably one of about, I don't know, 300, 400 in this one division. So I immediately heard the sirens, and it was raining outside. Then I didn't hear the sirens, and I got nervous that maybe the guys took a wrong turn, and I was already feeling this pain. I knew this was going to be ugly, so I started taking off my watch, my ring, my glasses. I unbuttoned my shirt to take it off because I knew they'd pop it open. I didn't want to mess up anything. And uh, when these five paramedics come walking through the doors, um, the first thing they asked me was, hey, have you taken any Viagra? And I was so proud to say, no, I don't need it, you know? <laughs> But nobody laughed. And just about that time, boom, I got hit. And those fellows worked on me. I didn't know everything that went on. All I knew at that point is that I could hear Mary talking to them, them talking to Mary. Remember them telling her to call different people. I heard her over there on the phone, and she was being so strong during all of it. And I was coming in and out. I... I told the guys, listen, let me just sleep through this. Because when I would close my eyes, I felt this peace come on me. Little did I know, but it states in my reports that I was coding. I was on the verge of my heart stopping. And um, so the next day, when all this happened, they finally get me to the hospital. The next day, I'm in ICU. They put a stent in my heart that night. And... Uh, now, these paramedics come by. I hadn't seen Mary yet, hadn't seen the kids. So anytime somebody would come in, I'd just cry. First, I was just glad to see anybody. Then I just felt this terrible guilt that I had put this pain on my family and on our church because many from our church drove up immediately to check in what's going on, and they rallied around Mary and the kids for food and taking care of the house and taking care of everything that needed to be taken care of. And so when these paramedics came in, they start to tell me their story, that this was the first night they'd ever worked together. All five of them had never worked together, but because of it being Father's Day weekend, they all volunteered to work, and they were from different stations in Stewart and even Palm Beach. And so they were there to check up. Because earlier that day that they worked on me, they had lost somebody. And someone had a heart attack. He was a little older than I was, and he didn't survive. And they were hell-bent on that day to make sure that I survived. And when they listened to Mary praying, they said, well, amongst themselves, they said, you know what? This guy evidently is somebody to some people because she's making a lot of calls. And evidently, there's something spiritual going on here. So they worked super hard. So they wanted to check in on me. And when they came back 
and they're telling me all these things. I then ask them, I said, how long do you guys work on me? I feel like, you know, I'm just so sore. And that's when they let me know, man, we worked on you for 42 minutes. We hit you seven times with the pads. And I remember one of those pads. It was like somebody dropped me off the side of a balcony and I hit concrete. And when that guy came down with his fist in the middle of my chest, man, words came out that we don't speak about on Sunday morning and it wasn't <laughs> tongues. But that's what I remembered. The rest I didn't remember. I don't remember the walk down. I don't remember getting in the ambulance. I don't remember any of that. I don't remember being in when they actually started doing the stent, except I told the lady I was sick and she told me, don't throw up on my floor. I'm like, you're rude. I'm dying. And you're worried about puke. And, uh, but yeah, that 42 minutes stood out to me. First sermon I preached when I came back to the church, like three months later was what I learned in 42 minutes having a heart attack. And uh, it stayed with us. So 42 has become this whole theme. And I, I promise you, once you read the book, you'll start looking around and seeing 42 everywhere. If, you read, if you're reading your New Testament tomorrow, you're going to hit Revelations chapter 13, and you're going to read about an angel being released in the earth for 42 months pretty weird. I'm watching Catch a Smuggler the other day on Nat Geo, and they showed a guy that was in the, incarcerated, and they blurred out his face, and all they'd show you is his tennis shoes, and he had 42 on his tennis shoes, little tiny 42 on his tennis shoes. So 42 has really become something. It's become the theme of our lives, and it's the theme of our church. And what I love, it's on the back of this book. It says, if you're not dead, God's not done. I'm glad they clapped because the other two campuses roared when we said that. Maybe they needed to hear that. I'm going to say it one more time. If you're not dead, God's not done. Amen. So whatever you're going through, whatever your 42 is, if you're still breathing, if you're still living, if you're still alive, that's enough. That's all God needs to work in your life, to bring back a miracle in your life and to bring you back to life. Because I'll, I can tell you this, what I love about this book, and, and again, the, the long-term time that it took to write it, is because Steve was still learning, he was still living, he was still processing and going through it. We all were. You don't just write a book right after you've had a near-death experience and you know everything. There's a whole lot that happens from the moment of the 42 when it hits you to the time that you truly feel like you've got perspective and God is good again. There's a long road there, and that's okay because God's through it with us throughout all of it. God never left us, not in the middle of the heart attack, and he never left us throughout that entire process. And I, I want to say, I'm going to read the chapters now. I think it's a good time to read these chapters because this is what really stands out to me is the detail. Every chapter would probably represent a year or two of process. And the first chapter is the punch you don't see coming. The second chapter is 42 minutes that changed my life. The third chapter is on the ropes. The fourth chapter is blind spots. Chapter five is running with a limp. Chapter six is called the wall. And we just did a whole podcast. I think we did two basically on this whole subject, this chapter, the wall. When you hit a wall, a wall in your faith, a wall in your understanding, you know, when you do go through life changing moments, which we we explain by this, there are different degrees, but for all of us in this room, we go through things that happen that we weren't expecting to happen. Anybody? I'm here, and I don't know how I got here. This was not what we planned for. This is not what we had faith for. This is not what we sowed for, and now here we are. I wasn't expecting this, and it happened in my life. So when those things happen, there is a process that God is working out in you, and, and I I'm glad you didn't write it right away because so much understanding has come in your life because of the process and the journey on the other side of having to trust God for your dreams. Can I say something right there, Mary? Because, um, gosh, don't leave my brain. Come back, Holy 62. Spirit. Uh, you say that. So often we make a judgment call about ourselves mm -hmm. after we go through something yes. that could be our 42 moment. Right. We immediately make a judgment call. We make a judgment call about God. Yeah. The marriage didn't work, and we're like, where were you, God? 
where we look at ourselves and think, man, I'm terrible. Look what I did. Or we say, thinking thoughts like I'm unlovable. We immediately make a, 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 a judgment call yes. after an event hits our life. Yeah. I'm a bad businessman. My business fell apart. Now I'm working for somebody. We immediately think the worst of ourselves when we go through those things. When what we need to do, and this is just life lessons 101, is we let life continue to play out, making sure that we do our parts That's first. That's right. So we made the mistake, and we say, we'll never make the mistake again. How can I learn from that? That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. We're supposed to be able to look at our life's mistakes and say, I don't ever want to do it again. So let me learn something from this. And before I make a judgment call about who I am as an individual, let me let some things play out. Yes. And when it came to this, there was a lot that needed to be played out because I'm first feeling old. I'm feeling at 46, just then turned 47. I was just thankful to make it to 47 that I was decrepit, that I was, I was guilt-ridden because I felt like all those cheeseburgers for real early on brought this on and I wasn't taking care of myself. I felt like a terrible leader as a pastor. How can I lead others if I can't even lead myself? Then we play the blame game. You, yeah. We all do that. That's right. But if time goes on, you let time play out and you start making the adjustments that need to be made, then you find yourself taking that 42 moment and saying, all right, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. Because I learned never to do that stuff again or ever have to play out things that were happening before that. Yeah. So, yeah, th th that, that's a good thing in the long run. Which the wall helps you get through when you face that wall. Listen to the podcast. How many of you are listening to our podcast every week? Because it goes up every Wednesday. Come on, man. All right, y'all got to gotta listen podcast. to it. You got to listen to it. Let me just give it. you an example of where the, the, the wall would have been right here for real. That column, that mm -hmm. column back there, the wall isn't just subjective here. It's just, it, it was literal. literally a wall. That's the wall that I was talking about in. But it represented so, so much more than yes. just a wall. And that's why you've got to, you've got to listen to the podcast and get this book. Chapter seven is reawakening the dreamer. That sounds so good. And we all go, Ooh, you're awakening my dreams. But when your dreams have died, and when you're struggling with even feeling like dreaming again, and one of the things we've talked about is when dreaming was scary, because that has to do with the wall. For me, him dreaming again just meant exertion on his body. It meant that he was going to put pressure in an area that pressure gave him a heart attack. So there was a lot to overcome there. And then, of course, chapter eight. Oh, by the way, Reawakening the Dreamer, we're going to start a series right after Easter, a sermon series entitled reawakening the dreamer. You have a lot of people in your life that need this word, that need this message because they are dying without the vine. There's Christians dying on the vine, but there are people in your life that have no hope. They have no source. They need your invitation. Maybe through this book, get this book and give it to them and this will change their life. But we're going to continue this theme on for uh, reawaken the dreamer, not the dream, not the dream, the ability to dream, the dreamer on the inside of you, and then, of course, what you've lived out and are continuing to leave out so well. Live out is chapter eight, finishing well. And the conclusion is something I, I have admired so much about you and I've, I've learned so much from you is that you play the long game. Mm. You're not trying to play the short game here. Right. You understand it's a lifetime. You do that relationally. You're that way with your family. You're that way with your church. You aren't expecting high highs all the time. You're willing to play the long game. Can we do just, just try to make this now, not about me, but about you. Yes. And where does this play out just for the next few moments before we end? Because many of you have dreams that have been hijacked by certain events that go on in your life. And it could be a life-altering event that you will go through that sometimes comes your way where there it's just life altering moments for, I can remember early on for those that would want to get pregnant, maybe you couldn't get pregnant and there was infertility issues. And when you got the news that you couldn't get pregnant and you've tried everything that you've tried to do, you know, that's a life altering event that comes your way, or it's a life and death moment that comes your way. Like the loss of a loved one unexpectedly down at our Dadeland campus, a little boy, Ben, he fought the good fight of faith but his mom and dad had to put him in the casket. 
way before that little six-year-old boy should have been. And they had to deal with that. You know, what does that do to your dreams of your family? What, what, what dream did you have about marriage that was then ruined by divorce? What, what dream about your, your finances? You know, there's dreams that we have. And those dreams that we have, we sometimes just almost try to create like they're fairy tales. Some of you have a dream to be married and nobody's coming to your world right now. And you're like, man, I'm really having to stand in here. I'm about to lose my faith on this one because I'm ready to give up on that. Maybe I'll be single my entire life. Anytime you are tempted to negotiate with God on the dream that's on the inside of you, that's one of those moments where you got to say, all right, this is like my 42 moment. I can't give up on my dream. So what is your dream? Because the Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 37 that God, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires or the dreams of your heart. So what events come your way to cause you to think back or shrink back from the dream that you have. Our staff was going through a coaching session, a series on how to be coaches so we can help our church family and our leadership in the church uh, achieve their desires and their dreams and what they want out of life. So part of that whole series was we as staff uh, chose an accountability partner. And that accountability partner was... Now you come together, you share your dream, you put it out in writing, and then you look at the person next to you, your accountability partner, which by the way, couldn't be your spouse, had to be somebody else, and say to them, hey, hold me accountable to this. And then they start asking questions like, okay, what are you going to do to see that dream come true? Well, if I want to you know, have a better career, I'm, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go ahead and get my education. And then that person now is holding you accountable to it. So my accountability partner at the time was David Roman, John Roman's brother. He was on staff with us at the time. And so we sat down and we shared, what is our dreams? John, uh, David's dream was having a family, having children. My dream was writing this book because I had gone through this whole deal and I said, all right, I got to put it in writing. Got to put it out there. Well, I'm not proud to say, I'm a little ashamed to say that he saw his dream realized before my, I saw my dream realized. <laughs> And it's like, well, Steve, you should have had bigger dreams about other things going on in your world. No, this was so serious to me. I wanted to get this thing out. Well, what we have both learned in this whole process is that dreams cost you something. There's a price to pay for the dream that you have in your heart. It's not fairy tale Walt Disney World experiences. There's a price that every one of us will have to pay for the dreams that God has put deep down on the inside of us. You're not going to just walk into that dream without it costing you something. If you're not willing to pay the price, the dream isn't near as big as a God-ordained dream. Because every God-ordained dream is going to cost you something. Look at Jesus. He was the savior of the world. In order for him to do that, to be what God had birthed on the inside of him, his whole purpose of existing was to be the savior of the world, but it meant it's going to cost his life. What is your dream costing you every day? What is it costing you? Well, one thing the enemy is going to try to do is snuff it out because he'll allow pain to come into your life. And when a person is introduced to pain, many times they pull back and they say it's not worth it. You know, I was quite, at that point after experiencing this crazy thing, I was ready to kick life in neutral and just coast. Because I hard, hardly had enough faith for myself, let alone being a spiritual leader as a pastor, to build up faith in other people. I didn't have a lot of faith for my own dream. But something shifted along the way, Mary, that allowed us to pay the price. And a lot of it had to do with patience. A lot of it had to do with giving ourselves a little space just to 
slow down a little and recoup and mentally get reengaged. Stay, we, ne we never lost out on our connection. You were so good to stay up close and personal every step of the way, even though you had your own fears about losing your own dreams about life. Right. But the price was paid for David and Paolo Roman. They paid a price. Yeah. They couldn't have children on their own naturally. And fertility didn't even work. No. And the blessing they are today to their two adopted daughters is through the it's roof. Huge. They're huge. So they paid a price. Yes. And we have to pay a price sometimes for the dreams that we desire to have. Yes, we do. But it's worth paying that price. It is. The testimony that it gives you when you hang in there. Your life is your testimony. And I think you need to just share as we're closing. There was um, one particular paramedic that the other paramedics told you just about a month or two ago that you needed to remember and thank because it was such a powerful, very pivotal. And that goes back to how the story continues to unfold, even in writing the book something that you didn't know before, we didn't know, um, when you had asked the paramedics, who, who should I list in this book to say thank you to, the, other, the paramedic you were speaking to said, you need to mention this particular paramedic's name. Yeah. And why? I, I wanted to acknowledge the paramedics because these men were so influential. So I reached out to uh, one of them, and he says, yeah, you got all of them right, but there's one more you need to uh, mention. And he gave me his information, and... Um, so I, uh, I wrote this because uh, I said this to the guys in part of my deal. I said, today I have an even greater respect for the first responders who selflessly serve our society. Pretty interesting how the night was the first and only time you, all of you had worked together. Evidently, there was a much higher purpose the creator had planned. My prayer is that you would know the power of the one who inspired you to give me one last shot of new medication for my recitation. It was Rich who said in a text, the minute we pushed that med through the IV and shocked you one more time, it fixed you and you stabilized. I tear up because as I read that, I just can't believe that I was the guy that needed just one more chance at surviving in life. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe your dream is something that you started to renegotiate. Maybe you're going through something or have gone through something that's just caused you to have all this anxiety and this fear. If you haven't yet, I'm not saying it will come. But I am saying there's going to be a price that you're going to have to pay somewhere for your dream to be realized. And when that time comes, I hope this book will help you. I hope this, I hope this book will just give you an image that even though you can be that close to death, just one more shot to survive. You'll see yourself, yeah, maybe down for the count. But you haven't hit 10 yet. And as that ref starts to count you out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Everybody else thinks you're done. But you still got three more counts to go. You may be on the ninth count, but I want to encourage you today. Get back up one more time. Because even though you may feel like you are finished, there's some tremendous truths that I hope you'll be able to find in this book that'll help you finish well. Father, Mary and I just pray over this precious congregation and everyone that's under the sound of our voice. Even today, Lord, things start to make sense even more. I pray that, Lord, your people, wherever they may be at in life, will see that life in the Spirit is about overcoming. They're not done yet. Greater is the one on the inside of them than the one that's on the outside of them. 
There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. They're not condemned, Lord. It's still time for them to get up and fight again. Because if the spirit of them who raised up Christ from the dead is on the inside of them, then thank you, Lord, today that spirit will raise them up, even they may, even though they may feel like they are down. Thank you today, Lord, that all things are working together for the good to those who love you. And Lord, even the thing that we're facing, what shall we say in response to the challenges of life? Here's what we know. If God is for us, who can be against us? Bless your people today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey there. If you enjoyed this video from Metro Life, then we have more content for you to enjoy. We've got music, podcasts, sermons, and messages from our team. We believe that relationship matters, and getting to know one another is a key part of those relationships. So get to know us by looking around this channel. Like, comment, and subscribe, and we look forward to meeting you soon.